In science fiction, we often see immense starships attacking planets, crushing or besieging them, but in our own future, we may deploy powerful orbital fortresses to defend our world. Way back in the late 90s when I was just starting college, one of my favorite sci-fi TV shows, Babylon 5, was wrapping up its fourth season with the end of a story arc about a human civil war that had an attack on Earth. CGI was just starting to let us have grand space battles between large fleets instead of a handful of physical spaceship models, and so Babylon 5 and Deep Space Nine and some others were featuring episodes with dozens or even hundreds of ships flying around. In this climactic episode, the good guys managed to trick the defending fleet out of position and temporarily out of play and jump to Earth directly to begin the assault. Classically in sci-fi, one or two ships are evenly matched against a planet, we even have the upper hand, but in the episode we suddenly see a whole bunch of big orbital stations flick on, rotate into play, and begin firing high energy beams and volleys of missiles and just start beating the heck out of the fleet. It is a great episode to end the penultimate season of one of science fiction's best TV franchises, but it got me rethinking a lot of classic space opera ideas about how space combat would work and challenge the tendency to think of planets as rare jewels in space that were terribly vulnerable to attack. That indeed a massive fleet rolling up to a planet was likely to be involved in a one-sided fight, just not going the way we expected. And a lot of that would come down to orbital defense platforms and space fortresses, and that's our topic for today. What they are, what their strengths and weaknesses are, what combat with them would be like, and what life on them would be like, and when we might start seeing them. And if that sounds like fun, make sure to hit the like and subscribe button to the channel for future episodes. I think the first key point to discuss is the mobility issue. Planets are hard to miss and hard to move, unpredictably anyway, they generally move tens of thousands of miles per hour, but in very well known courses, and the sorts of energies needed to move them are immense and not likely to be something you could deploy quickly to move the planet out of line with a death ray or missile attack. Spaceships on the other hand are very mobile, but the problem is, under known physics they need to use insane amounts of fuel and energy to move, and every bit of mass they devote to more armor and weapons slows them down or requires more engine. A defense platform orbiting a planet can avoid this as it doesn't need to move and can put huge amounts of armor on and weapons on. Racks of expendable missiles that can be fired rapidly help to cover some of the weakness it would have from not being very maneuverable. It can fire them all off and be destroyed, so you just calculate its median lifespan of full scale conflict and make sure its weapons are built to fully discharge in that time. It's not likely an incoming fleet could jam your communication with ground side control, so they could remote control it from bunkers down on the planet, and you could have a backup automated firing system able to kick in if the comms were damaged or jammed. Or it could unspool a really long, thin antenna cable right down to the atmosphere to restore comms. Big missile boats in space, but it raises the issue of beam weapons and slower munitions, guided or unguided. And as we'll see, the mechanics on that have some flaws that tend to get overlooked in casual geeky chat on space combat, so let's begin there. A key aspect of space is that it is huge, just mind-blowing in scale, and even the tiny little dot of space that is our orbital volume around Earth is immense. That difference in scale from orbital to interplanetary to interstellar is going to be very important, but begin by recognizing that spaceships don't just park near each other and fire weapons from a few miles away like old school ships of the line. A low orbital engagement is better compared to a pair of seagoing vessels attacking each other while one is in the Atlantic and the other in the Pacific. The engagement ranges only grow from there, and for context, Two big battleships throwing down in cislunar space might see one by the moon and another over at our L5 Lagrange point, and the scale there might be to imagine two plastic ship models, like they used to use in sci-fi pre-CGI, and a distance between them of a couple hundred miles, rather than the couple hundred thousand they really are. At this range, a beam of light or any other electromagnetic radiation or gravity or any relativistic particles is taking just over a second to reach its target, but we have to double that because there's no guidance on the beam once it's fired, 
and you only know that target ship's location as what it was when light bounces off it and travel to you, also taking a bit over a second. Even with highly automated tracking, targeting, and firing systems, that means your shot had about 3 seconds of enemy motion to deal with. Needless to say, any missile or solid slug has more flight time, but those might have guidance packages. If a ship is just moving along, it's easy to predict where it will be in 3 seconds, assuming you knew its velocity anyway which is very likely at this range. They can't see you aiming at them and move either, the light from your ship travels at the same speed as your weapon, you cannot dodge a laser beam. However, you can randomly jitter around when you expect combat to be at hand. If I can make my ship accelerate sideways at 3G for 3 seconds, and pick a random direction for that to occur in, then anyone targeting me now has an uncertainty of my position of 132 meters, and assuming that's decently larger than my ship, which we will assume is a convenient saucer shape 13 meters in radius, they now have a 1% chance of any beam they fire into that uncertainty window actually hitting me. This tells us the de facto ranges of combat, as it's determined by how big your ship is, or at least how big its exposed cross section is, which is probably narrow with long spaceships likely being the norm. Having defense stations or your own fleets able to attack from the side and its bigger cross section is also likely to be a thing and a reason for having your defense installations spread out. Based on how fast you can randomly jitter that spaceship and how big it is, that's your odds of getting hit, especially if your enemy has a decent guess at your acceleration profile. Great big spaceships with great big plates of armor probably want to stand off at great big distances. Tinier ships want to get in closer, though not too close. They want to be where the odds of being hit are lower than their odds of hitting you. Now the discussion comes down to two important questions. How long you have fuel for randomly jittering around, and how long you're in an engagement window. It is entirely possible you might assault a planet with ground forces, we discussed that in our episodes Planetary Invasions and more recently in Dropships some months back, but otherwise there is no reason to slow down, and more to the point, not every element of your fleet needs to slow down. Your vanguard might not bother decelerating on approach and plow by the planet, and if they are moving at 1% of light speed, that window of engagement is very short. They'll get to within the moon's distance of Earth and crash by and back out to that distance on the other side in roughly two minutes. They didn't slow down so they have a lot of fuel to use for jinking around, and any guided munitions you have suffer a difficult intercept trajectory with those fast and brief targets. I should note though that their speed is not without issues, because at that speed any object is hitting with huge force, including the space junk probably lying around any settled planet, even assuming they don't have automated mines that simply fragment in debris for such ships to hit. Which they do, because it's the best defense against anyone ramming their planet with a spaceship or relativistic kill missile, intentionally or by accident, during open war or an act of terror or sabotage. One detection sets off any other fragmenting cluster mines in the trajectory of the incoming object and wrecks its whole day. Buzzing by the enemy planet at high speed is a real option for forced assault but so is getting swatted like a fly or shotgunned by strategic debris deployment. And non-strategic debris too, as a space battle is going to start leaving wads of high-speed shrapnel all over the place. The other end of that is fuel consumption, those ships slowing down to engage are using fuel to do that now have less to jink around with. On the other hand, those orbital defense platforms presumably don't have that much, which is probably not true. They're in an easy position to have a fuel stash and get refueled after or even during combat operations. Refueling can take place by matter or energy beam too, and that planet below has a lot of both to lend its sentinels. However, here's the big misconception about fuel use here. You do not need to burn any to jink around quite a lot. Let us imagine a pair of space fighters running parallel, and Ace and his wingman. The two can burn fuel to jink around, but they do not actually need to because they could have a thin tether between them and a winch, and swing around using that and reeling themselves in and out. Those tethers might be good for entire miles of separation even with conventional materials, let alone those contemplated by options like space elevators and skyhooks, and you might have several backup and redundant ones able to clamp onto willing partners, 
allowing replacement if one ultra skinny wire gets broken. You can get a lot more elaborate with that setup, especially with multiple ships in a whole squadron. Even having an automated system orchestrates slinging the ships around with detachable and reattachable cables. The key point is they can be doing random high G maneuvers constantly as they enter combat and without much fuel being used. The thing is, so can those big orbital behemoths. Indeed many probably already would have tether systems in place like skyhooks for easy refueling and resupply, or for electrodynamic tethering to regenerate their orbital momentum. We could imagine a large network of defense platforms all interconnected with cables, which would make signal jamming harder, potentially even with hard lines down to the planets below. They might be up in space but not actually orbiting, we'll get back to that later. A big fortress might also just extrude outward into segments like a bunch of spiders sharing a web, and you might also be having expandable fortresses like that to shield a planet from direct attack with a physical shield, since science doesn't seem to leave us many options for the classic cool sci-fi force field. Though there are some, see our episode on force fields for further discussion. On the matter of dodging, by fuel or by physical rearrangement of a connected system, it is important to understand that time is your ally for getting missed. If a rival planet in your solar system 10 light minutes away has a powerful laser array in orbit, then you make sure everything you have in space that's worth targeting is making a minor correction about that often. Applying 1% of a G of acceleration for 10 seconds every 10 minutes would be unnoticeable to those on board, and would move you a meter per second in some direction and have you over a kilometer away 10 minutes later. Thinking of large constructs, motions of this variety can also be achieved by having six telescoping protrusions that would extend and retract in each of the directions up, down, left, right, forward, and back. Even just having very long gun barrels you could extend out would do some of this positional changing, and every time one of them moves the main body of the station does too. Even civilian space habitats, most of which would have plenty of ancillary space stations attached anyway, their docks and space farms and power collectors and so on, probably would do these minor tweaks of position constantly just as a matter of basic security. We're seeing that there is no major advantage to being one big block like a Star Trek Borg cube, though we also want to keep in mind that lasers and unguided beams aren't the only weapons in the arsenal, they're just very fast and thus accurate in space. The flip side is that any missile, torpedo, or guided slug you fire at someone won't need a very advanced tracking system to get them, it's mostly about ensuring the weapons don't get blown up by beams before hitting. But armor matters too, and bigger is better in that regard since an identical but larger object ten times wider can keep a thousand times the guns and ammo on board, but needs only one hundred times more armor to have it at the same thickness, so can afford thicker armor this is the cube square law. It's the compensation bigger ships and stations have for being less maneuverable, they can afford thicker armor and more point defense weapons. And if those point defense systems are lasers or near light speed beams, they should be able to always detect and hit any sublight guided munition. This doesn't make those munitions useless though, one option is deploying them before they strike, such as a directed blast from a shaped charge or a Project Excalibur style bomb pumped laser, which would now be more accurate since the beam could be aimed and discharged closer to the enemy. They can also employ the technique of having a volley of missiles all connected with tethers and using those to jink around while flying in. They do not have to actually hit, they could all be nukes, bomb pumped lasers, or fragmenting devices that detonate once they reach range and before the laser point defense becomes a sure thing. Same for solid slugs which might come out of a barrel as a munition but might spread out for the flight and then pick individual targets or even retract back down to hit one spot very hard or in a rapid sequence. Those munitions might also simply be very heavily armored. Point defense will always have an advantage hitting things when closer with beams but at the same time there are likely to be real mechanical limitations on how fast a weapon can get on target and aim. Thus you probably have an engagement window with any given defensive weapon system and odds are the smaller ones will be able to track and fire faster. They also might be too weak to penetrate armor on a bigger munition or boarding shuttle. Whichever the case, we see that the future is likely to see a wide panoply of both spaceships and weapon types and sizes, and that the same is likely to be true of orbital defense systems. 
In the early days in particular, such a platform only needs to be designed to take out unguided junk in space or dangerous asteroids. A given damaged ship or satellite leaking fuel or air might randomly twitch a lot while this is going on, but at a distance of just a few thousand kilometers and probably only briefly. Remember a light or a laser beam moves a few hundred thousand kilometers a second, and even some robot drone isn't altering its trajectory much in a millisecond. You armor these early platforms because if a Kessler Syndrome event occurs, they'll start taking damage and they are the maintenance mitigation and debris clearance tools you have to work with in space. Of course you could have weapons down on Earth too, and this is another reason why non-beam weapons are important. An attack on Earth isn't going to use beams unless someone around a distant star is fielding a Nikol Dyson beam or Quasar Cannon with the intent of eradicating the actual planet. There's defenses for that we'll get to in a moment, but lasers and ion beams do not do well against atmospheres, so you would probably be using solid slugs to bombard the planet below, guided or unguided, which means your orbital platform needs to be able to engage those and ablate them enough to wreck their guidance packages or send them on a tumble through the atmosphere that's likely to detonate them or make them fall off target. So you need to take those platforms out before invading. Point defense isn't limited to laser beams or flak cannons either, it can involve extending huge inflatable or extendable shields which now have to be torn through before further attacking the station. We might put tens of meters of armor on a station but also have it able to shoot out compacted shells full of what's basically a solar sail that detonates a few hundred kilometers away from it into a big thin shield only a ten thousandth of a meter thick. I should also note that in addition to these purpose-built defense platforms, orbital space around any planet may already include tons of solar shades, mirrors, and power collectors that can be rapidly released for defense, and that as orbital space fills up with junk, it makes every weapon less effective, which in turn benefits the defender. Not that they'll likely be happy watching trillions of dollars of orbital infrastructure get torn to pieces, it's just a nice consolation prize. The Defender gains more time for coordination or reinforcements to arrive, they are protected down on the planet by their atmosphere, and those platforms likely have much thicker armor than the invading ships do. Every fragment becomes more dangerous at higher speed, so it presses the engagement slower and closer to the planet. And you do not want to be close to an orbital defense platform. Amusingly this justifies boarding actions to try to take that platform, at least the bigger ones, since it's entirely likely they are over-armored giants, possibly converted asteroids, and probably do not have tons of personnel or huge contingents of marines or automated kilomajigs on board. There's always tricky calculus for both sides on if they just want to blow something up or try to take it or take it back. In sci-fi there's some self-destruct device, and that's doable, but more likely you'd have all the hardware and systems encrypted so your enemy can't turn the platform against you unless they had spies on board or many days to work at it, and you are not likely to embed a nuclear device in your station where it is sitting for many years over your planet waiting for some terrorists to get their hands on your self-destruct codes. Admittedly your station might have thousands of nuclear missiles on board, just not rigged to casually and intentionally kill all of you if someone knew the right code or your commander went insane. You also want a decent amount of personnel on board in your station that's too big for your planet, or planetary guns, to rapidly take apart themselves if someone gets their hands on engine control and tries shoving it down on your planet, the tactic known as a colony drop. And of course part of a defense platform's job is going to need to be having the means and capability to take out a piece of orbital infrastructure or habitation that someone is trying to weaponize that way. To really think about how you build these defense platforms you have to contemplate the intended means of attack and how your platform can help with that. Fleets are a classic option but we spent plenty of time on those already. What about a long range attack with something other than a directed asteroid? Let's say Mars fired on us with an RKM or relativistic kill missile. This is a guided slug moving at some high fraction of light speed, possibly even at ultra relativistic speeds. They can be deployed from neighboring planets or a neighboring stellar system, or even halfway across the galaxy. They are fairly stealthy but hardly invisible, and it is likely you would instantly detect that launch from a neighboring planet. 
except it's probably reaching you shortly after you see that launch, as it's moving at high fraction of light speed. You will likely start pinging it the moment you have a hint of its existence and it can start doing random jinking before that or once you do that, but you either need to blast it with something moving at a similar speed or faster, like a laser, or you need to have something smaller it runs into, since anything it hits is going to crash into it with the power of nuclear ordnance. Your 11 ton slug moving at 87% of light speed is carrying 10 to the 21 joules of energy in it, the equivalent of a quarter of a million megaton nukes and more than both sides had at the height of the Cold War. That is not a war in the event, the asteroid that we think wiped out the dinosaurs was at least a few thousand times more potent than that, but it's a terrifying weapon and is likely to be part of a salvo. RKM launchers, especially at interstellar range, can fire a chain of RKMs off, each following one just a bit faster, so they all arrive at the destination at the same time to clog your defense systems. But even if that 11 ton missile of doom is built out of something sturdy, like being one big slab of steel or uranium, which wouldn't be much bigger than you or I at that point, it still cannot survive running into even something the size of a piece of gravel or quarter. That quarter at 5.67 grams of mass would hit the RKM moving at 87% of light speed with 122 kilotons of explosive power, several times more than the atomic bombs deployed at the end of World War II. Indeed, even a dime would have more energy on impact than both of those bombs combined had. No more RKM, and honestly, that would be overkill. RKMs are insanely lethal, but their very nature makes them dangerously vulnerable. They can jink around too, but will be visible doing it, and you use a lot less energy scattering a bunch of dimes through the space a volley is approaching than the enemy uses sending up that RKM. Their speed makes it hard for them to detect and dodge or vaporize things themselves, and they are not going to have lots of room for detectors and point defense systems, but they may have some package for that. RKM size is likely to be some optimal exchange of the smallest object you can fit sufficient guidance and detection gear on to avoid easy destruction, so that taking them out is not super easy. In practice you might start by firing off a projectile like the ones we mentioned earlier that detonates in an area and fills it with a thin spread foil shield, or tiny little pellets, along with some sensor drones to help track and guide and those pellets might have tiny little boosters to let them be tossed more accurately in the way of the RKM. Indeed your pellets might all have tethers connecting them so they stay in a given volume, rather than continuing to spread out. You might fire a grid or net of tethers with lots of tiny weights at the junction, or thin film a micron thick with tiny beads spaced out at typical RKM cross-sectional width. Even a microgram of matter, a billionth of a kilogram, is carrying as much explosive power as an entire crate of hand grenades. This is not going to vaporize an 11 ton slab of metal, but is going to leave it damaged and flying blind, and easy meat for layer 2 of defenses. There might be tons of these giant ultra-thin screens hanging between it and the primary minefield full of more of these boxed up and waiting to blow out or unfold and simpler automated cannons that form the first wall of defense. These can be fired directly toward the munition or from the side to intercept it as it tries to plow into another facility or planet, and each wave of attack builds up more free defenses, though of course is also hampering your defensive efforts a bit and your civilian operations a lot more. This general approach also works against beam weapons but mostly by rapidly building up a cloud to diffuse the energy. You may leave thin film shields on direct paths between you and enemy star systems with the intent of them giving you that brief instant of warning and defense so you could pop off defense clouds. As to the defense platform itself, what the types are, I think we would be envisioning something like a local hub that had a lot of ancillary facilities attached to it. Probably physically too. You may have tethers and wires out to each tiny sensor and weapons pod even tens of miles away, just to avoid attempts at jamming or hacking or waiting to spool out and magnetically grapple to the pod so as to avoid being a navigation hazard during normal operations. Or those smaller pods might spend most of their time withdrawn entirely, inside the larger defense platform, with just a few deployed out for standard emergency management of local collision debris. Now a defense platform might not be a big space station, it might be a retooled asteroid as that's cheaper and you could be permitting mining operations on it. 
A floating mountain in space is not an easy nut to crack, and if you imagine trying to blow up or assault a mountain fortress here on Earth, by which I mean an actual mountain, not some castle city on it, it's just as bad except you're not sneaking up on it either. Another option is a non-orbiting space tower. This may require active support, and you're probably already using them for civilian purposes, but it's just a very tall tower rising up into space and then probably spreading out wide. I could imagine thousands of these things having actual physical metal shields they could expand to form a shield wall around a planet, possibly several layers of them extending from the lower levels of the tower and rotating to prevent puncture through multiple layers at any single point. That's a massive piece of infrastructure, but honestly, not as crazy as it sounds like, and you could have huge amounts of power running from groundside nuclear fission or fusion reactors to power those things. See our Space Towers episode for more on their function and civilian uses, but some thousand kilometer tall, ten kilometer wide tower rising like a spike off a planet might be a gun all on its own for fleeing relativistic flak at incoming enemy fleets and missile volleys. There's really no limit on how big you might build your planetary defenses, and if we imagine just 1% of your budget was for your military, and just 1% of that budget was for building and maintaining orbital defense platforms, then the same sort of ecumenopolis planet-wide city K1 civilizations we contemplate on future planets might have tens of millions of military personnel stationed across tens of thousands of miles wide orbital behemoths looming in orbits and throughout cislunar space. Which might look pretty ominous to those below, too, each one carrying crustbuster nukes and a huge array of energy weapons, mass drivers, and railguns, each with tons of deployable weapon pods and forward defense pods able to suddenly unfold as minefields and obstructions. Tag team that with lots of mundane civilian habitats with some weapons of their own, normal or quickly upgraded, your actual planetary defense fleet and any ships able to arrive as reinforcements, and you've got one tough nut to crack. Even before we start unlimbering skyscraper-sized guns down on the planetary surface for surface-to-orbit anti-ship fire. All in all, when it comes to space warfare, an orbital defense platform is probably not a bad place to be, at least compared to whoever has decided to attack your planet. As to if there's anyone on the platform, that's hard to say. I think your smaller pods are automated and bigger ones might have a crew of anywhere from a lone person up to an entire military division of 10 or 20,000 on board. It's very likely this is where your traffic control for space is taking place at. So they might be the equivalent of a military town with some escape pods for jamming the civilians into before battle begins to drop to the planet below. Same line of reasoning, in tense times you might pull the families off and jam-pack a few more brigades of marines and several wings of fighter craft into one. They might be an isolated microgravity outpost a few introverts staffed on a one-year rotation, spending their off time online since the planet is right next door, or they might be some mined-out asteroid you crammed an entire rotating habitat into, with towns, malls, schools, and all the normal trappings of civilization. In all likelihood it depends on the planet, its population, and the era we're in. You might be in orbit of Earth when it's the capital of some multi-planetary empire of quadrillions and where the home defense navy alone numbers tens of thousands of capital ships with billions of sailors and soldiers on board that fleet at those platforms. Or it might be the lonely multi-purpose station hanging over some dwarf planet that guards the space elevator descending from it and tracks and repairs the handful of satellites orbiting the ice ball. Without an atmosphere, the main defenses are scattered around down on the planet and hidden under hundreds of meters of ice, where the defense turrets just melt their way up when the time comes to open fire. While those around a gas giant might be one part aircraft and hide in the atmosphere, and others might orbit in the upper layers of a red giant star and use it for cover, gliding up to attack. The options are virtually limitless. But the one sure thing is that these defense platforms or towers will likely exist and sooner than later. They'll begin simple around Earth and mostly intended for handling asteroids, traffic control, space debris clearance, and rogue satellites or spaceships, or possibly for anti-ICBM purposes, but as time goes on they'll only grow in number and size. 
and it is quite likely that some of the Force space habitats will be defense platforms too, possibly before even the end of this century, especially small scale ones. They will be the final line of defense before an invader attacks Earth itself, but as we saw today, they will be no small wall to overcome, and the bastions on which many an invader might crash their forces and break their teeth in vain. So last month we released our big, 3 hour long Fermi Paradox Compendium, and in it I raised a few new solutions that we had never discussed before, including one I thought up earlier this year after a question on our live stream, the Hermit Shoplifter Hypothesis, and since it was a compendium I had to keep that conversation short, but I thought it deserved more discussion, so this month's Nebula exclusive is going to deep dive this idea that civilizations might end up melting down into a lot of individuals or small groups fleeing for deep space and stopping to grab or steal resources along the way. That's out now on Nebula, where you can not only see every regular episode of SFIA a few days early and ad free, but all of our bonus content, including extended editions of mini episodes and more Nebula exclusives like ultra relativistic spaceships, dark stars at the beginning of time, life as an asteroid miner, nomadic miners on the moon, space freighters, retro causality, orc OR and free will, conformal cyclic cosmology colonizing binary stars, and more. Using my link and discount, go.nebula.tv slash IsaacArthur, and my code, IsaacArthur, Nebula is available for just over $2.50 a month, but this holiday season we are once again offering lifetime memberships to Nebula for $300, part of which goes directly to our show and part to help raise capital for a number of creator-owned projects we're greenlighting for 2024. Instead of a monthly subscription, lifetime memberships are a one-time payment where you can get access to everything that's on Nebula now and in the future, including our quickly growing catalog of exclusive movies, plays, shows, documentaries, and more. And right now, for the holidays, you can even gift a lifetime membership of Nebula's life-changing and stimulating content. Monthly, annual, or lifetime, whichever you choose, you not only get access to all of the great stuff Nebula offers, you also be directly supporting this show. Again, to see SFIA early, ad-free, and with all the exclusive bonus content like Hermit Shoplifter Hypothesis, go to go.nebula.tv slash IsaacArthur. For anyone who is curious, I ended up making a number of bonus episodes recently for both YouTube and Nebula like today's episode, our December Nebula exclusive, Hermit Shoplifter Hypothesis, and later this month, Will We Colonize Space, along with last weekend's Space Hygiene episode, and I basically flipped a coin for which would go into which spots. Some will be rolling out in January and February too, and mostly a result of me having a bit of a creative bumper crop in some free time. Hence our fairly packed schedule for the month, call it a holiday gift, as I don't expect to keep up this tempo of production. We'll continue that holiday tempo with a discussion of how to select spaceship crews this Thursday, before returning to our Alien Civilization series for Sci-Fi Sunday on December 10th, with a look at Nihilistic Aliens. Two weeks from now we'll talk about ways to warp and manipulate reality on December 14th. In 3 weeks we'll look at discussing silicon-based lifeforms on the 24th, and then our bonus episode on if we will colonize space. After that we will finish the month and year with clearing space debris on the 28th and our final livestream Q&A on Sunday, December 31st. If you'd like to get alerts when those and other episodes come out, make sure to hit the like, subscribe, and notification buttons. You can also help support the show on Patreon, and if you want to donate and help in other ways, you can see those options by visiting our website, IsaacArthur.net. You can also catch all of SFIA's episodes early and ad-free on our streaming service, Nebula, along with hours of bonus content at go.nebula.tv slash IsaacArthur. As always, thanks for watching, and have a great week.